Chapter 1. The Facility In a dark room, within the glow of the monitors for company, sits a woman watching the screens. Every screen is filled with different news footage, but they're all showing riots. People killing people as if they are filled with rage. Her head remains motionless, but her light blue eyes are scanning every screen, watching every frame. Enter. The door to the room opens, shining light on the woman in the chair, who continues studying the screens. At the door stands a woman dressed in military uniform from head to toe. Ma'am, you wanted to be informed when they arrived. Thank you, Private. The soldier walks down the corridor, leaving the door open. The woman waits a moment, continuing to watch the footage, before getting up and leaving the room. She closes the door, and the screens continue to show footage to an empty, pitch-black room. A large crowd of people are standing inside a single room, each person carrying a suitcase as they talk among themselves, with fear on their faces. The woman in charge walks into the room and onto a stage set up at one end. She's in her late thirties with light blonde hair, which is tied back into a bun with a hair stick poking out. Her light blue eyes scan the room, studying everyone, before beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, I will make this quick. No one wants their time wasted. The rage virus has spread and infected the world. The safest place is currently here in Great Britain. The virus has already run its course here, which means this place has the lowest amount of infected. My name is La Fleur, and I'm in charge of the facility. Let me make one thing clear. I don't want any problems while we are here. Do you understand? We are not here to do research. Fight infected or save the world. Our only goal is to wait it out and survive. 28 days left. In a small armory, two of the soldiers are quickly getting their weapons together. On the uniforms, the names Brad and Edward. While wearing their uniforms, the only way you'd be able to tell them apart is from their size. Edward being tall and skinny, while Brad is short and fat. Edward was also the fortunate one of having good looks, while Brad is an ugly looking man with a fat face to match his body and a nose that looks like he'd just run into a wall. Gee, where's Cord? He's supposed to be on duty. Where do you think he is, Brad? He's where he normally is, playing with the doctor. The two soldiers grab their guns and Edward grabs a spare. They head out the door, running down the corridor. They arrive at an intersection where another soldier joins them. The newly joined soldier has the name Wayne on his uniform and is not wearing a helmet, showing off a dark brown buzz cut of hair. Edward throws him the spare gun and continues running. Wayne looks to be the youngest of the three, a few years younger than Brad, but with both of them being in their very late twenties, while Edward's is the oldest, by over a decade being in his late forties. Here you go, Wayne. Thanks, Ed. It's Edward, not Ed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just us three? No one else? Cord should be here, but he's not. I'm telling you, man, those two were secret lovers. Why else would they spend so much time together? <laughs> you wish, Wayne. Shut up, Wayne. Just give me your walkie. Wayne pulls his walkie-talkie out and hands it over to Edward. In a doctor's lab sits a soldier in a chair while a doctor looks into a microscope. The soldier has the name Cord on his uniform. The doctor wearing a traditional lab coat with his eyes on the microscope while he holds his glasses in his right hand. Unable to see his face, all you can see is his bald head with white hair around the back and sides. Cord's grey eyes are fixed on his green drink, unsure as what to make of it. I know what you are thinking, however, that that is the only thing spare going around. Would you prefer a glass of water, Cord? Nah, tired of water. That's all the soldiers get. What's this drink called again? It's called the creme de menthe. Why are you looking into that microscope? You're only meant to heal anyone who's sick. Yes, Cord. However, we've been here for 15 days now, and no one is ill. Now, a mind like mine has to be kept occupied. It may be the apocalypse, but I refuse to let my brain die. It needs to be kept occupied, so might as well do some studying. So, exactly what are you looking at? Infected blood. <laughs> Lafleur finds out she will not be happy. We both know you won't be telling. Uh, Diego? Yes, Cord? Do you think there's an afterlife? Uh, kind of nice knowing the people who get turned into infected are at peace. First of all, no, I don't believe in an afterlife. I'm a man of science. Although I do think destiny is out there. Second, the infected are still alive, not dead. Looking at these sounds- Cord. Come in, Cord. Over. Cord grabs his walkie-talkie off of his belt. 
Yeah, I'm here. Over. We need you in supplies. Infected have breached the facility. Need you to do your job. Over. On my way. Over. Cord downs his creme de menthe and checks that his pistol is with him. Diego continues looking into the microscope, not even looking up. If you can get me uninfected without anyone knowing, I'll really appreciate it. Only if no one knows, though. It it will help advance my research. Um, I'll see what I can do. Cord runs out of the lab, leaving the doctor alone with his research. Cord runs all the way to the supply room, a room the size of a warehouse filled with supplies to keep the place running. Cord looks around to find Brad, Edward, and Wayne behind wooden crates, shooting the infected running towards them. Cord spots an infected, wearing a priest's robe, dodging the bullets and getting closer. Now's my chance. Cord runs over to the others with his pistol drawn and aimed at the priest. The bullet flies towards the priest but misses and continues straight into a gas canister. Fuck. Chapter 2. Supply Run. Lafleur is walking down a corridor as a short fat man wearing a suit and glasses tries to catch up to her. Excuse me, excuse me, what was all that kerfuffle? We're all talking about it, yet not one of the guards wants to give us any answers. Everything is fine and under control. Go back to your room. Fine and under control? Fine and under control? Those were explosions, we all heard it! The facility is currently not swarming with infected. We are quite safe, that is fine. The explosion has caused some damage, but we are currently sorting that out. Everything is under control. Now, Mr. Raven, go back to your room. Lefleur walks away from Mr. Raven, who is left annoyed and speechless. He stands in place until deciding to go back to his room. In the garage of the facility, Wayne and Edward are making room in the back of a truck. Lefleur enters, keeping her eye on them. Diego walks up to Lefleur with a disappointed look in his eyes. He takes off his glasses and begins to fiddle with them as he talks to Lefleur, his head looking at the ground. Lafleur, why am I going on this mission? I am currently the only doctor here. Hell, I'm probably the only doctor left in the world. And you want to send me into danger? Lafleur listens to every word, but keeps her eyes on Wayne and Edward. Have. Have what? Have. Have to. I don't want to send you, but I have to. We need medicine more than anything. The explosion wiped most of it out. You're the one who knows what is what. I have to send you. You'll have two guards to protect you. They are under orders to protect your life at all cost. I want you to do something for me as well. And what is that? Bring Edward back at all cost. I'll have need of him later. All packed up, ma'am. Ready to go. Lefleur walks away from Diego, and Diego puts his glasses back on and goes over to the truck. Before Lefleur can arrive at the truck, Cord walks over to her. I would like to go on this mission. I'm not stupid. I know how much time you spend around him. You don't have to constantly follow him. I owe him a lot more. Fine, but it's on your head. Cord makes his way over to the truck, joining Diego, Wayne and Edward. With Lafleur standing just in front of them, she chooses her next words very carefully, weighing every word. The Manchester Three. Everyone's head turns toward Lafleur. We all know the story. They survived the first wave of infected and got rescued. They survived a lot more than just infected. These were three ordinary people, one of which was a child. They had no training. If they were able to survive, so will you. There's not many infected out there at the moment. You have nothing to fear. I have every faith you will succeed. Lefleur turns around and walks into the facility. Everyone else gets inside the truck and leaves the facility, venturing into the apocalypse. Wayne drives the truck down the open road, with the others in the back. Um, whatever happened to the Manchester Three? They're dead. They got taken out of Great Britain, and soon the infection followed them. They would have been dead long by now. They survived once, they could survive again. I mean, they would have more practice than anyone. No, 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 no. They, they, they had each other the first time. After they got rescued, they were split up. A child was taken into a German foster care. Jim was on trial and sentenced to death for killing Major West and the other soldiers. He was scheduled to go in front of a firing squad. So he was shot before the infection went global? Maybe, maybe not. The infection could have put a halt to that. The girl, on the other hand, disappeared. 
No one knows what happened to her. Unfortunately, Edward is probably right. Chances are they're dead. Everyone who is not in Great Britain will die. Too much for anyone to survive. Get ready, you lot. We're here. Everyone gets out of the truck to see a hospital in front of them. <sighs> why, why are we here? There, there are way better places to search in the area for medical supplies. Nah, here we'll do. It's close so we can't waste any more gas. Once the gas is gone, we're never going to have any more. Best to make it last. Now let's start searching. I'm in charge here, Vane. Sure thing, Ed. Whatever you say. It's Edvard. Diego, let's go have a look. If we don't find anything, then we look elsewhere. Let's move out. Chapter 3. The Survivors Inside a dark hospital room, a man shines a flashlight around open cupboards, looking for something. A woman sits in a chair nearby, while a much younger man is taking a bandage off of the woman's left hand. The room is so dark, the three figures blend into the shadows. Please tell me you've found something yet? Not yet. And please keep your voice down. We don't know how many Victor in this place. Okay, sorry. Alex, if you want to do something useful for once, then go look inside one of those drawers. Bandages are probably in there. Y yeah, fine. Alex goes over to the drawers while the woman walks over to the other man with the flashlight. Being nice to him, Danny. He's already scared. He doesn't need you to feel worse. We both know that was my version of nice. I don't get along with people. Just how I am. Well, if something happens to me, I won't be around to act as a buffer for you. You need to- Nothing's going to happen to you, Lillian. I have a massive gash on my hand with an infection. I'm not exactly at my finest hour. Well, tough. You're not allowed to die. I don't want any more lives on my conscience. They weren't your fault. Enough of them were. Lillian. Sorry, Lillian. I've got more bandages. Lillian keeps contact on Danny before walking over to Alex who begins to wrap her left hand with a fresh bandage. The three figures freeze in place like statues, waiting to see what happens next. Alex, get the bandage wrapped around Lillian quickly. We need to move. Danny uses his arm to sweep all the medicine into his backpack. He picks up a hammer off the desk while Alex secures the bandage on Lillian's left hand. The three of them leave the blacked out room and out into a corridor lit only by green emergency lights. They run towards the stairwell as quick as shadows. The three run past a sign with the number 8 on it, and they start making their way down the stairwell. They reach the fourth floor, where a blockage has sealed up the rest of the stairs, forcing them to go out into the hall. As they return into the corridor, three figures have their guns pointed at the three survivors. Each gun has a flashlight at the end shining into the survivors' faces. All three of them are wearing dirty and torn clothes, as if they've been wearing them for months. Danny looks in his mid-thirties with long black hair and a scruffy beard. Lillian has an innocent face with long auburn hair flowing down to her shoulders. Finally, Alex looks no older than a teenager with short, dark brown hair and only a slight blonde stubble as if he's unable to grow a beard. They freeze in place, waiting, unsure of what to do next. Stop, 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 don't shoot! They're not infected! Doesn't mean they're not a threat. So you guys are the ones shooting up this place. That's a big problem. Look, the noise is attracting the infected. We've got no problem. We've got guns to protect ourselves. You, on the other hand. Diego steps between the two groups, trying to calm the situation. Everyone just calm down. We are only here for supplies. How about we let you go, and we'll continue searching. You're not gonna find any medicine in this place. And why is that? Lillian leans closer to Danny and whispers in his ear. They all have accents. None of them are English. Why are you guys here? I told you, for supplies. Now why would we not find any here? Well... Whoa, 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 whoa. Answer my question, then we'll answer yours. All of you have accents. You're not from this country. Why are you here? How about we just shoot you? Because they're not worth the bullet. Other ways to kill them, though. No, no one is a threat to anyone. Look, the virus got out to the rest of the world. I thought the thing was worldwide to begin with. Only Great Britain was infected to begin with. We sealed you guys off and uh, once the infection was gone, we tried getting this island back together. But in return for our help, the virus escaped. The whole world has the rage virus now. Safest place is right here. Lowest amount of infected. That means you guys have a base. We want in. The reason you won't get any medicine is because the hospitals raided at the beginning. One room was lots of supplies inside, but we got there before you. 
will give you the supplies for entry to your base. It's not just medicine we need. We need more supplies and don't need more mouths to feed. We will trade you for the medicine, but we cannot give you entry to the facility. An infected woman crashes through the stairwell and straight towards Danny. Danny elbows it in the chest and smacks its head with the hammer until its brains are reduced to a pulp. <sighs> we have food and bottle water! More on the way! Do we have a deal? Diego looks at the infected. It's the first time he's seen one in person. In the distance, more infected can be heard running down the stairwell, and he weighs his options before answering. Agreed. Wayne, lead the way. Uh, Kurt and myself will rotate. Let's go. Wayne leads the group the way that they just came towards the entrance of the hospital, followed by Diego and the three survivors. Edwin and Cord stay at the rear, covering for each other, holding the swarm of infected off. Why are there so many of them? The place didn't sound full. They were lurking in the shadows. If they don't have a reason to move, they won't. Their energy lasts longer that way. Your gunshots gave them a pretty good reason. Wayne, Diego and the survivors run outside into the sunlight and make their way down the steps and across the car park towards the truck, hoping to get it started in time. Cord and Edward hold position by the door. You go. I'll hold them off. No, I'll stay here. Ten seconds I'll run and you'll cover me. I'm in charge here. That's an order. Cord follows the order and runs towards the truck while Edward continues shooting the infected as they swarm towards the reception doors. Eight. Nine. Ten. Edward turns around to see Cord still running towards the truck. <coughs> Edward jumps down the steps and turns to see an infected woman lunging towards him. Edward moves to the side, tripping over and firing a round from his gun. <coughs> the bullets Edward set off go straight into his right leg. Edward's blood sprays all over the infected woman. Cord reaches the truck, turning around after hearing the scream, and see Edward crawling towards his gun. Cord begins moving towards Edwards, but Diego puts a hand on Cord's shoulder. You can't save him. I have to try. No, you don't. You'll die. And what good will that do? Diego helps Cord into the truck. Wayne starts driving but begins to turn the truck towards the hospital. What are you doing? You're gonna kill us. Relax. I'm just putting Ed out of his misery while having some fun. Nothing's wrong about that. Wayne drives the truck towards the swarm of infected, piling on top of Edward as he screams in agony. Wayne plows the truck into the infected, crushing them and Edward, killing most of them, but as they look down the back of the truck they can see figures getting up off the floor. Chapter 4 Arrival The truck drives into the garage of the facility with the new survivors and their supplies. The Fleur walks into the room to welcome back the supply team. To her surprise, she sees the new people exiting out the back of the truck. She starts walking up to Diego, who is talking to Lillian. Lillian, would you like to follow me to my lab? And I'll get you some antibiotics. Yeah, sure thing. I'll meet up with you two later. No worries, Lillian. Yeah, see you later. Lillian goes up to Danny and whispers in his ear. Talk to Alex. Get to know him. <sighs> Fine. Lillian pulls out a green backpack from the truck, giving it to Danny. She reaches in again and pulls out a book. She goes to follow Diego, but sees him talking to Lafleur. Diego. Please explain to me what is happening here. We found survivors. We didn't have a choice. Look, Cord will fill you in. I've got work to do. I'll ask Edward what happened. I'm afraid you cannot. He, he didn't make it. Sorry, that there was nothing we could have done. Lillian, if you would like to follow me. Diego and Lillian leave the garage. Lafleur, hiding back the anger but still visible in her light blue eyes, goes up to Cord. Cord sees Lafleur on a warpath and looks down at the floor, hoping she will go to somebody else. What happened out there? Huh? Out there. What happened? Oh, we ran into these uh, survivors. They had supplies, so they brought themselves in. It's only three more mouths, but they were stocked up on food. The medicine they had. Uh, Diego says all of it will have a use. Fair deal, if you ask me. Uh, we can get them to help out around here. They've, they've got experience fighting infected, and... And they know the area. And Edward? He was holding the infected off while we escaped. He shot himself in the foot. How? No, I mean he literally shot himself in the foot. He couldn't run, so the infected got to him uh, before we could. Wayne tried to put him out of his misery. Uh, not sure if it worked, though. Um, excuse me. The Fleur turns towards Danny, who has made his way over to them. His right hand rubbing the back of his long, scruffy hair, trying to think of what to say. Fleur replies with cold, hard silence. My name is Danny. Over there is Alex. And the one was Lillian. I'm guessing you're in charge of this place? That is correct. Well, it's good to finally have somewhere trying to do good. Out there, 
Everyone's in it for themselves. Anarchy. You have our supplies, and if you need anything, please ask. Any chance we're able to get some clean clothes? We're low on rooms, so you three will have to share. The only spare clothes we have are military uniforms, which are for personal only. I doubt any civilians would share their clothes, so you'll have to wear your rags for now. Been doing that for a while now. Unload the truck. I'll get your room sorted. Wayne, come to my office in a few hours. Lafleur turns and walks out of the room. Not much emotion, but uh, at least she hasn't kicked you out. Over in Diego's lab, Diego's looking through his cupboards while Lillian sits on a chair next to Diego's desk, playing with her auburn hair. Diego takes a small box of medicine out of the cupboard and goes over to Lillian. Here we go. These antibiotics will do you good. Thanks. Last thing I want is to lose my arm. <laughs> I don't think that will happen. Diego spots the book Lillian brought with her sitting on the desk. What book are you reading? Oh, it's called The Beach. Surely there are more important things to carry around than a book. I like reading. Should I just give up on that as well? Well, when you put it like that... Can you answer a question for me? Well, that depends on the question. What day is it? We've lost track and it would be good to know what today actually is. 3rd of September. The virus arrived in Paris on the 4th of August. We arrived here on the 18th. Please, answer one question for me. Diego takes off his glasses and begins fiddling with them in his hands. The infected. How human are they? How do you mean? Most people have been saying they're zombies, but they're still alive. It's the blood that makes them turn, not dying. You've encountered them more than myself. Do they still have any humanity? Humanity? All they try to do is kill you. They don't have any. Uh, this a bad time? At the door to the lab, Cord is standing there, awkwardly, unsure as to whether he's allowed to come in. No, we just finished. Thank you, Lillian. The other two are in the cafeteria, waiting for Lafleur to give them a room. Do you know where it is? Yeah, Diego showed me it on the way here. Thanks, guys. For everything. Lillian leaves the room. Cord walks up to Diego, who has a strange look on his face, and is still fiddling with his glasses. You can see the gears turning inside his head. I need something from you, Cord. Yeah? I have a new task to keep my brain occupied. I got the idea when I saw Edward's blood go over the infected. An idea I need to test. Destiny has provided us with what we need. And I already know who gets the honor. Chapter 5 Destiny The day has gone and night has arrived in the facility. Everyone is asleep except for the guards on duty and Cord who has snuck outside. He remains in the bushes, undetected. He moves stealthily towards his target, shuffling down the street. He slowly creeps up behind the infected and uses his gun to whack the infected on the back of the head. The infected goes down to the floor, and just like that, Cord grabs its arms behind its back, handcuffing them together. He puts a bag over the infected's head and leads it back to the facility. Early in the morning, Danny and Lillian are in line at the cafeteria, waiting to get their breakfast. Behind the counter is a soldier with the name Emma on her uniform. Her red hair is tied back into a ponytail, keeping it out of the food. She's handing out the same meal to everyone. One sausage, two slices of toast with butter already on, one slice of bacon, one egg, and a fruit of choice. Danny gets his food, followed by Lillian, who looks at the food in disgust. Sorry, but I can't eat this. I'm a vegan. Ta shit. Everyone gets the same. Do you know what a vegan is? The only thing I can eat here is the apple. It's the apocalypse, not a time to be fuzzy. Be thankful you're not starving, lady. Being vegan isn't being fussy. I don't believe animals should die just so we can eat. I stick by what I believe. Lillian, now isn't the time for your vegan rant. This soldier isn't budging. You can have my banana. Lillian turns away from Danny and looks the soldier in her brown eyes. What is your name? It's Emma. Can't you read the uniform, you stupid bitch? Now, Emma, do you stand for anything? I stand for the lives of animals. You're not even a soldier who saves lives, you're just a lunch lady. I'm the reason you're alive right now, bitch. Beat it before I start kicking your fucking skull in. Lillian and Danny take their trays and find a place to eat their breakfast. Lillian looks at all the civilians in expensive suits eating their breakfast while Danny's focused on eating his. I can't believe this is real. I keep thinking I'm going to wake up. 
Stop staring and eat your breakfast before it gets cold. How long has it been since we had a hot meal? I have fruit. It's not going to go cold. Well, before it goes off then. Excuse me. Lillian and Danny look up from their food to see Mr. Raven in a black suit barely covering his belly, standing beside their table. His piercing brown eyes glare at them through his glasses. Yes? If you don't mind my asking, how did you two buy yourselves in here? Sorry, it's a bit early in the morning. Can you be a bit clearer, please? Well, I know the price of a ticket here was five million each, except for children who were at four. And, well, just look at you, too. Uns turn in dirty clothes, scruffy hair. You look like the homeless. I'm just wondering how you two got the money. We didn't pay with money. We gave them supplies. Oh, I thought the government would have had the supplies already, rather than let the likes of you two in. We arrived yesterday. We were born in this country. Accents might have given it away. My word. So you two have been out in the wild, living with the infected. Yeah, you should be thankful of this place. It won't last out there. Oh, I could. I've gone camping before. It's nothing like camping. Could you please leave us alone to eat our food? I have no reason to be scared of you. Just because you've lived outside does not mean I should fear you. Not only that, but I was in prison. So I'd like it if you stopped looking down on us. I'm not scared of you. Besides, I have much better things to do with my day than talk to two homeless people. Good day. Mr. Raven walks away from the table. Danny and Lillian watch him go. Danny making sure he doesn't look back. Don't say anything, Lillian. You know I don't get on with people. Ha! <laughs> always enjoy scaring these lot myself. They turn around to see Brad standing near the table with a massive grin on his face, as if he was watching the whole conversation. Lillian notices his nose and is unsure as to whether to ask or not. Nice touch had in the prison part. That guy, he always has his nose in something. Nothing is ever right. You Scottish? We heard you in the first outbreak? Nah, I was overseas then. Part of the army. Just here by luck, if I'm honest with you. The army people here were all brought in at random. Everything was a mad rush, so it was whoever they could get over in time. But when we waited out in the infection, I'm going home to Scotland. Waited out? Yeah, that's the plan, eh? We're going to wait out the infected. That's it. Nothing else. So you two are the survivors that got brought in? There's another guy, Alex. He was gone when we woke up. Probably gone to get a shower with a wave out of water. These rich people have one every day. Hot water normally runs out at eight. He's probably gotten lost and walking around with a towel. <laughs> now there's something that will brighten my day. In Diego's lab, Alex is strapped down to the table. Straps are over his bone-like arms and legs, with a final strap over his dark brown hair keeping his head down. Alex slowly starts to wake up, and the first thing he sees out the corner of his eyes is an infected tied to the table next to him. He's waking up. Diego walks over with his hands in his lab coat and places his head above Alex's looking down on him. Please, please. Hello, you have been given a rare gift. You will go down in history. So I have this theory, which you will help me test out. This infected you see over here, he is actually still a person. It's only his blood that makes him like this. Hence the term, infected. Your blood is not infected. So I will try a blood transplant. He's into yours, and yours into him. If we restore his humanity back to him, then we have just found a cure, which will be very helpful if we hunt down infected people who can help build the new world. We can cure them and use their knowledge. I have high hopes for this. Destiny gave me the idea. At the same time, it gave me you three. It's meant to be, I think. I'm afraid it had to be you. Danny is too strong and Lillian is on antibiotics. Can't have too many variables. I'm sure you understand. So it has to be you. I'm not sorry. Need of the many and all that. Let me go. Please, I'll do anything you want. I'll do anything. I'll do, I'll do anything. You already are, Alex. This is our destiny. Diego starts the blood transfusion. 
Diego and Cord exit the room as the infected blood begins to flow in dwellings. Chapter 6 Discoveries Danny and Lillian are walking down the corridor searching for Alex. Lillian's face is filled with fear, worrying about Alex, while Danny doesn't seem to show any concern. He's nowhere to be found. Maybe he's looking for us and we're all going around in circles. Yeah, best thing to do is go back to our room. He'll go there when he wants to sleep. Danny and Lillian suddenly bump into Mr. Raven, who has changed his clothes since breakfast and is wearing a blue suit. Hey, buddy. Uh, new look? I am not your buddy. Not after how rude you were to me this morning. I was only asking a harmless question. I'm going to talk to Lefleur. Get you two thrown out of here. You mark my words! Mr. Raven notices the bandage on Lillian's left hand. Dear God, girl! You're sick! You better see a doctor. With how dirty you two are, you're probably infected, and will get the rest of us infected as well. I need to get to Lafleur. Mr. Raven hurries down the corridor away from Danny and Lillian, who watch him go. See what happens when I try to be nice. You make friends everywhere you go. Wait, maybe Alex has gone off to see the doctor, or what was his name? Diego? Why would he? He wasn't sick. Hey, it's worth a look. Lillian starts walking off while Danny rubs the back of his head and reluctantly follows her. The two enter Diego's lab to find an infected Alex on the table trying to break free. Oh my god! Lillian tries running up to Alex, but Danny holds her back. No, don't get too close. He's infected. Look next to him. They've kidnapped someone else for their experiments. Next to Alex lies another infected, but unconscious. Unknown if the experiment worked. What the fuck is this place? It's all just a scam. The infection never went worldwide. They made it seem like they did so rich people could buy tickets to this safe haven. I mean, think about it. If the world is infected and civilization gone, why would they charge money to run this place? This place is not here to save people, but to use us as lab rats. Lillian, grab as much medicine as he can. We're leaving. Chapter 7 Evacuation Lafleur is walking down a corridor to deal with a few of the residents' concerns. One of them. Lafleur picks herself up off the ground and turns back the other way, running towards the security room. She enters the security room and starts scanning through the cameras. She stops when she reaches footage that shows the garage. As the dust settles, a massive hole where the door should be can be seen, not long followed by an infected pouring into the facility. Ah, <sighs> shit. Lafleur grabs the microphone and holds it up to her mouth. All personnel go straight to the armory. Any residents make your way to the cafeteria. This is not a drill. Lafleur runs out of the room and straight into the armory, pushing past residents trying to get to safety. She enters the room to find Diego, Cord, Wayne, Emma, and two other soldiers. Is this it? Where's everyone else? They're probably hiding with the residents. What's going on? Lafleur walks over to the weapons and starts getting ready. Infected have breached the facility. Grab what you can carry. Wayne and Emma, go down to the cafeteria and lock the doors. Meet us in the garage. Yes, ma'am. You know I'll do anything you ask. You can't do that! They need our help. If we lock them in, they'll start screaming. And the infected will go straight to them, leaving the garage free to escape. We don't have the numbers to fight that many infected, just saving who I can. You're more than welcome to join them in the cafeteria. The Fleur starts leading the way towards the garage, while Wayne and Emma go off towards the cafeteria. Diego stops at Cord before they leave the armory. Come on, Cord. Nothing more can be done here. I want to stop off at my lab, see if my theory was right. Diego and Cord leave the armory, but go in a different direction than the others. Over in the cafeteria, Brad is stuck near the edge of the room, trying to calm everyone down. All the residents are panicking, and Brad is beginning to feel like he can't handle the situation anymore. He wipes sweat from his brow before speaking. Please, just stay tight. The floor will be down in a minute, and she'll explain everything. You must know something! Yeah, you'll never tell us anything. We demand answers. What was that loud noise? The explosion? It was an explosion. Beyond that, I don't know. I came straight here to protect you guys until the floor arrives. Look, more soldiers. Maybe they have answers. Brad turns to see Wayne and Emma walking towards the door. Brad starts walking up to them. Finally, 
some reinforcements. What's going on, guys? Wayne and Emma stop on the outside of the cafeteria, and Brad on the inside with the door separating them. You'll want to be on this side, Brad. What do you mean? The floor has given me and Sugar Tits orders to lock the door, seal them inside. Infected have gotten in. This place is a sinking ship. We've got to protect ourselves. And time is running out. Time to pick a side. What? That can't be. We're here to protect them. Mm-hmm. Suit yourself. Wayne grabs the doors, closing them on Brad, while Emma wraps the chains around the handles and locks them shut, leaving Brad inside with the residents. What's going on? What did they say? Wayne and Emma turn around, only to run down a different corridor. We make a good team. We should fuck sometime. With you. No thanks. Ah, lesbian. I only like real men. Just your tits? I'll cut your dick off and throw it to the infected. Nice. I like a woman who can fight back. Back in the cafeteria, Brad runs up to the window to see Infected sprinting towards them. Barricade these doors! Infected are here! Brad moves away from the doors, getting his gun out ready. None of the residents move to help. They only scream, which brings more Infected towards them. Diego and Cord enter Diego's lab to discover Alex and the Infected are both dead, their throats slit open by a scalpel. What? My experiment! What happened here? Two new people destroyed my experiment. Could have saved humanity, but they chose to watch it burn instead. Look, Diego, I'm sorry, but we need to go now before Lafleur leaves. Uh, you're right. Lead the way. Diego and Cord leave the lab and make their way towards the garage. In the garage, Lafleur is refilling one of the trucks. One soldier is loading the back with supplies, and the other is watching the entrance for any more infected. Diego and Cord enter the garage, hurrying towards the truck. Diego with his hands in his lab coat pockets, and Cord with his gun out. Thought we lost you two. No, just wanted to stop by my lab. I'm afraid there wasn't anything useful I could find. Never mind. We're taking the truck you used yesterday. Supplies didn't get unloaded. Disobeying my order came in handy for once. Just need to refuel and fit what else we can. Nothing we can do about the blood on the front. <laughs> Everyone turns towards the hole to see the soldier who is meant to be guarding the door, getting attacked by an infected. Ryan, take over. The other soldier takes over refueling and Lafleur shoots the infected and the soldier. More infected appear through the hole. All the infected get shot down and fall to the floor. Emma and Brad appear by the door with their guns out. Always had good timing. Ma'am, we locked the residents inside. We also found Brad. He chose his side. Let's get out of here. Lafleur gets behind the wheel while Cord and Diego get in next to her. Suddenly, more infected swarm in through the hole. Lafleur starts driving, keeping it slow for people to hop on. Wayne and Emma start running after the truck while an infected attacks the other soldier. Lafleur drives through the infected, trying to get outside. Emma shoots the infected and the soldier who is about to turn. Wayne and Emma holster their pistols and start sprinting outside following the truck, trying to catch up as more infected start chasing them. Dusk has begun to set in. Not much longer, and the sun will fade, leaving everyone in the darkness. Wayne makes it onto the truck with Emma trying to catch up. Emma jumps up onto the truck, holding on by just her fingertips as an infected grabs her legs and gets pulled along with them. Wayne, help me! Wayne rushes up to Emma and grabs both her breasts, pushing her off onto the road with the infected. That felt good. Lafleur, I'm the only one who made it. The truck picks up speed and drives away, leaving the facility behind as the sun begins to set. Emma lays on the ground next to the infected. She takes out her gun and shoots it in the head. <laughs> Emma sees more infected chasing her. She gets onto her feet wipes her red hair out of her eyes and starts running. No longer able to see the truck, she starts making her way in any direction that doesn't have infected. Her heart is pounding in her chest as she tries to escape towards the blood red setting sun. I will fucking kill you, Wayne. Back in the truck, everyone is in silence while they try to process what has just happened. Lafleur wipes small strands of hairs out of her eyes and Diego washes the side of the road, the gears inside his head still turning frantically. It was the new people. My gut told me not to let them in. So what are we going to do? We'll find somewhere to secure and survive. No, I, I mean to Danny and Lillian. What are you talking about? Yeah, I am not following you. You said you know it was them. Let's get our revenge. They, they fucked us over. You want us to start hunting them down? How on earth will we do that? Easy. Use their truck's GPS. Chapter 8 the Execution Danny and Lillian drive down the road in the truck that they got from the garage. 
They've sat in silence for an hour, and Lillian finally decides to break the silence. Why didn't we take the truck with our supplies inside? It was low on petrol. That was the first truck I tried. So what's the plan now? We've got limited supplies. We keep driving. If we can find supplies, we've got enough petrol to go far. Just read your book. But in which direction, then? If we don't have a plan, randomly driving around will only waste our petrol. Fine. Stop! Danny pulls the truck over to the side of the road and gets out. Lillian pauses for a moment before joining him. Lillian walks over to Danny, who has his hands on the back of his head, fingers hidden in the black of his scruffy hair. I didn't mean it in a bad way. I just want a plan. Why are you looking at me? I've got every member of our group killed. Zoe, Gia, Jedediah, John, Kat, everyone! It was my idea to join the facility, and now Alex is dead because of it. I'm not a leader. You should be. You stick by to what you think is right. It's the apocalypse and you're still a fucking vegan. Do you want to know what I think is right? You being the leader, we all have problems and right now all that matters is surviving. Do you know what today is? The day we die. It's my birthday. I asked Diego what the day was when we met yesterday, and that was the 3rd of September. So today is my birthday. Why didn't you say something before? Well, because I didn't think you gave a shit. Danny turns toward the sound to see a truck from the facility driving towards them. The other truck's headlights shine straight on them. Shit, get back in the truck. Danny and Lillian run towards their truck as the other truck starts to pick up speed. Danny jumps in and starts the engine as Lillian makes her way around to the other side. As soon as she's in, he starts driving. As they're speeding down the road, Lillian straps her seatbelt on, then reaching over to do Danny's. All tight. Up ahead on the road, abandoned cars are scattered all over the place. Danny does his best to drive through the blockage. As Lillian's arm comes back across, Danny swerves, making her knock into the radio, turning it on. Find us. We are reporting the storm. Safety awaits. Please find us. Do you hear that? Someone's we out there. The More focused Safety on awaits. who's behind us. Danny's truck scrapes another car, sending his flying off the road and crashing into a tree. Both Danny and Lillian are in an unknown place, vision blurred as they try to get their bearings. The doors open and they get dragged out onto the grass. Danny tries to grab his hammer, but he's already outside by the time he thinks of it. Wayne forces Danny onto the ground, while Cord does the same with Lillian. The headlight from Lafleur's truck lights up the side of the road. Both of them on their knees, they look up to see Lafleur and Diego looking down on them. The light from the truck making their shadows stretch far behind Danny and Lillian. What the fuck do you want? Payback. Lafleur raises her gun towards Danny's stomach. It won't kill you. Just prevent you from fighting back. Then, the real fun can begin. <sighs> I wouldn't do that if I was you. Everyone turns toward the voice to see a man in his late forties wearing a brown trench coat with long black hair but a clean-shaven face, out of breath by the side of the road next to Lafleur's truck. Chapter 9. Rescue. With the sun almost gone, every second that goes by the world gets darker and darker. Very soon, night will be completely upon them. Everyone looks toward the stranger, trying to catch his breath. Sorry. Saw the car chase and had to run here. Anyway, I wouldn't do that if I was you. Who the fuck are you? My name is Killian. I'm from a small community not far from here. I'm scouting for more survivors. Saw the car chase and, well, I had to intervene. This has nothing to do with you. Leave now. Last warning. Also, my first. Look, I'm sure there's a good reason for you guys wanting to kill each other. Hell, for all I know, they could be cannibals. I just don't want any innocent person dying. So we're going to go back to my community, we'll have a trial, and anyone guilty will get punished. You just gotta have faith. Any questions? Why the fuck do you think we would ever agree to that? Light it up! Suddenly, in the darkness of the night, Two dozen torches spring to light surrounding everyone, the glow of each torch revealing a silhouetted figure. I don't want any innocent to die. If you've done nothing wrong, you've got nothing to fear. Now drop your guns and follow me. Lafleur drops her gun first, followed by Cord and finally Wayne. They all start following Killian. The people with the torches follow gradually, picking up their weapons and keeping them surrounded in a circle. Killian leads them to his community. 
After walking for roughly 30 minutes, they arrive at the community. A few streets of houses have been surrounded and sealed off by a wooden wall. On the street in front of them is the front gate, made up of two large wooden doors. A watchtower has been built near the gate. A figure in the tower gives a signal as the gate swings open, revealing the community. Kirian leads them through the front gate, where they are greeted by two twins in their early thirties. The twins watch the mass group of people enter. The male twin has short, dark, blonde hair, while the female has the same colour, but it's tied back into a ponytail with a purple ribbon. The female twin stands there with her arms folded, and the male twin has his hands together, fiddling with a ring on his middle finger. Ah, Kellyan, You've brought us guests. To what do we owe the pleasure? Found them trying to kill these two. Killian points over to Danny and Lillian. We need to have a trial. Fair enough. Can't lose any more innocence. <laughs> and here I thought we were going to get a decent night's sleep. You will all be taken to different rooms, asked questions, and we're going to try and figure out what's going on. Daddy! A boy and a girl come running down one of the streets. The boy runs up to Violet and clings onto her leg, while the little girl jumps into Killian. Hey there, sweetheart. How are you and Mammy? We're good. Just worried about you. I know I said I'd be back before sunset, but these people needed help. And we... Always help people when they need it. Good girl. Take Tommy and go back to the house. Us adults will be spending the night helping these people. Love ya, Daddy. Love you too. Charlotte and the boy go running off down the street. Killian turns back towards Violet with a smile on his face, and Violet turns back towards the group. Any questions? Yeah. How do we know you're not a bunch of crazies who want to kill us? We already have you unarmed. If that was the case, then why would we need to lie? Wayne elbows one of the members in the face, grabbing two pistols off him. He points one towards Liam and Violet and throws the other to Lafleur, who catches it in the air but doesn't point it at anyone. Got your back, boss. Cord, Diego, grab a gun. Anyone else moves and I'll shoot. Lafleur lifts up her gun and points it at Wayne. What are you doing? You really think we'll shoot our way out of here? We have nothing to fear. As soon as they hear what happened, Danny and Lillian will be dead, and we can leave. Oh, get stuffed. If you're gonna shoot, then shoot. Otherwise, be quiet. We can't have you sharing information and cooperating your stories. Vane, drop the gun. Wayne hesitantly drops his gun to the ground, and Lafleur follows suit. The members of the community lead everyone off to separate houses. Killian goes over to Liam and Violet with his hands in his trench coat. I know you don't like me doing this. But I couldn't just let them die. What else could I have done? You just gotta have some faith. No, you did well. Some of them might come in handy. I'll have guards posted on the houses and the walls. Let Killian do that. We need to go and ask the questions now. By the time the sun rises, it will all be over. Chapter 10. The Trial. Everyone is inside a different house, isolated from the others. Each of them are sat in a chair with a member of the community keeping watch. Liam and Violet take turns asking the same questions to everyone. If you could have something now, more than anything, what would that be? A good night's sleep. My, my research. A blowjob, sweet lips. My freedom. A decent meal. My daughter. What happened to her? She lived with her mother. Dead now. So who were you before the apocalypse? Army officer. A doctor, but I also lived for research. In the army. What uniform am I wearing? Teacher. In prison. What did you do? Is that important anymore? Have you killed? Yeah. Only infected. Yep. Almost killed the both of you, didn't I? Never. I'm a doctor. I heal. More than I can remember, I did what I had to do. To keep as many people alive as I could. I did my best. When are you going to ask us what happened? What makes you happy? Reading. Drinking. Doing my research. With my job, I don't have much time for myself. I don't know. I don't really stop to think about it. I just keep going. <sighs> I'm, I'm not particularly a happy person. Everyone is taken out of the houses and back towards the front gate. Six chairs lined up next to each other. In the middle of the night, the only light they have is from the glow of torches lighting up the street. Really? That was the trial? <sighs> just a bunch of stupid questions. No, that was just to find out who you really are. This is the trial. They sit down in the chairs, with Liam, Violet, and Killian standing in front of them. So, who would like to begin? There was Danny, Alex, and myself. 
We have been surviving the infected since the beginning. Long story short is they had this facility set up for rich people to protect them from the rage virus. We managed to buy our way in there and Alex went missing. We found him being tested on in the doctor's lab. They turned him into an infected as well. Oh, please. That is nonsense. Everyone turns toward Diego, except for LeFleur, whose ears prick up but she keeps looking straight ahead, and Cord, who keeps looking at the floor. Uh, if you would let me explain my theory. You'll have your turn. At the moment, we'll let Lillian finish. Violet turns to Lillian, indicating her to finish the story. They turned Alex into an infected as well, and someone from the facility. We put them out of their misery and escaped. Danny wanted to cause an explosion letting infected get inside the facility. He said they deserved to die. They followed us and were about to kill us before Killian arrived. You left out the power of them lying. I don't think we have enough evidence for that. Feel free to explain, Danny. Turns out it was a bunch of lies. The people living there had paid money. If the world had broken down, what point is their money? The place was actually for them to run tests on people living there. So much for saving the world. Now. Not yet, Diego. Liam turns toward Lafleur. Lafleur. What's your account on what happened? We saved them, took them in and they destroyed our facility. A lot of people died there because of them. We wanted to take revenge on them and make sure they wouldn't do that to anyone else. So you don't agree with the testing? No, we never did any testing. I made it clear to everyone at the beginning, our goal was to wait it out until the infected all over the world died. Okay, Diego, what have you got? Diego takes his glasses off and starts fiddling with them in his hands as he talks. Ah, well, I'm not sure they can be trusted. They've spent so long in the apocalypse, I don't think they behave like civilized people. I'm not fond of killing, but it would have prevented them from hurting anyone else. They're not like us. Their minds have been warped. Diego places his glasses back on and looks to Liam and Violet. Cord? Cord continues looking down at his feet giving a long silence to the question. Just tell the truth. You don't need to think about anything. We just want to know what happened. If you've done anything wrong, now is, now is the time. I, um, I am not a good person. I have killed people. Uh, my girlfriend had every reason to leave me and take Abigail away. I'm, I'm just trying to work out what is right. Okay, we took these people into the facility. We sheltered them, fed them, and Diego even healed one of them. And, and they betrayed us, tried to kill us. Look, I think you should know something first. God almost died. He got attacked by infected, and Diego saved his life. Since then, God is always around him, doing whatever Diego wants. It's like he thinks his life now belongs to Diego. Anyway... Lafleur, what happened to Alex? I... um... I don't know. I guess he died or ran off. Danny, Lillian, in your story, you killed him in Diego's lab. Did you do anything with the body? No, we just left him there. You left your friend behind? We put him out of his misery. We've lost a lot of people. We're not exactly in a place to give them a proper burial. Gotta look out for the living. So it seems Alex is the key here. If he's dead in Diego's lab, then we know what happened. Killian. Get up the scouts. We're going back to the facility at first light. Chapter 11. The Verdict. At the crack of dawn, as the sun welcomes a new day, the main gate of the community opens, and two carts pulled along by two horses each comes out. Riding in the front cart is Violet, Liam, Killian, Lafleur, Diego Cord, and Wayne. In the other is Danny, Lillian, two people in riot suits, and four more members of the community. They ride out onto the road towards the facility. In just over an hour, they finally arrive outside the facility. Everyone gets off the cart, and they gather together. Liam holds his hands together and begins fiddling with his ring. Killian, Henry, Nelson, you guys come with me. I'll come along to show you to my lab. <laughs> thanks. But if we run into infected, we're going to need somebody with fighting experience. Cord, you can show us the way. You're going to trust me with a weapon? No, I'm only going to give you a weapon if we run into infected. All right, guys, let's move. Liam, Killian, Cord, and two other people in riot suits move into the facility while the others wait outside. 
The Fleur walks over to Diego, who is looking at the facility through his glasses. They didn't want you to go because they're worried you'll tamper with the evidence. Did you perform experiments? I know you like to keep your mind active. I uh, had to. Had? Yes, I-, I had an idea for a cure. The blood is what? I don't want to hear it. After the 28 days, then what? How could we rebuild the world? If my cure worked, we could have brought back people who would have provided a use rather than a bunch of rich idiots who won't lift a finger. Solar power. Do you know how that works? I don't. But if my cure worked, we wouldn't need to. We could have just found someone who did, and... Lafleur walks away from Diego as he tries to defend himself, and walks over to Violet who is sitting on the cart watching everyone. Lafleur walks over to the cart and sits next to Violet. Diego just informed me he infected Alex. I swear to you, I had no idea what he was doing. I believe you. But me and Liam will need to discuss what will happen when they find Alex's body in there. What is with Liam? I see his ring. Did he lose them? You look for small details. Well, that is where the devil is. He lost his wife. I never liked her to tell you the truth, but he liked her, so that means I had to as well. Just before the virus happened, she was in a car accident. Hit a cyclist, went off the road and crashed. She didn't make the trip to the hospital. Inside the facility, the search party moves swiftly and silently through the corridors, approaching Diego's lab. Cord, stay here. Can't have you messing with any of the evidence. Liam and Killian move into the room while the people in riot suits stay outside with Cord. Liam and Killian walk into the room to see a deceased Alex and another person next to him strapped down to the table. They look at each other, both knowing what the other is thinking. Killian walks over to Alex in complete silence. Minutes later, the search party walk out of the facility and over to the others. Killian has Alex's body over his shoulders. When they arrive at the others, Liam walks over to Violet and takes her away from the group. Diego looks towards Liam and Violet, gears turning in his head, trying to think of what to do or say next. We found Alex's body. Just how Danny and Lillian told us it would be. I know. Lafleur got the truth from Diego. I don't think she knew what he was doing. Does it matter? What about the two soldiers? Yes, it does. We can all do something bad with the wrong information. Cord was just doing what Diego wanted. He's loyal, that's it. All right, a trial period. See if it's worth keeping him. Wayne, I don't like or trust. But do we actually want him? I I don't think we do. No, but he hasn't done anything wrong. Yeah, not to mention Lafleur and Danny won't get on. That doesn't mean she shouldn't be allowed in. After Killian puts Alex's body on the cart, he goes over to Danny and Lillian. Got his body for you. Give him a proper burial when we get back. If... You'll be joining us. Thanks. Haven't really got anywhere else to go. Does this mean we were right? Yeah. Just gotta see what the decision is for everyone else. Liam and Violet walk over to the group and stare at Diego. Liam has hatred in his hazel eyes, while Violet's are filled with sorrow. Leave. Now. You will get no food. No weapons. Nothing from us. Is that it? I'll be fine. I've got the facility right here. Yeah, best of luck killing the infected with your bare hands, buddy. Liam and Violet turn towards Cord for his judgement. Cord, we're not entirely sure about you. We're willing to give you a trial period. No, I, I want to go with Diego. Cord, they're offering you a safe place to live. You don't owe Diego anything. Yeah, uh, I do. If that's your choice. Liam and Violet turn towards Lafleur and Wayne. <laughs> we're honestly not sure what to do with you two. What do you mean? We're not sure if you'll be a good fit. We're worried there might be some problems. The Fleur turns pleadingly towards Killian, hoping that he will save them. Killian, you are a man of faith. How about we let faith decide? Me and Vane will go back to the community. If we make it, we're allowed in. If not, well, problem solved. Killian thinks it over before he turns towards Liam and Violet to share his opinion. I think it's a good idea. You two are unsure. Might as well leave it to fate. Violet and Liam share an uneasy glance with one another. Come on. Just gotta have some faith. We'll allow it. Well, you may as well get walking. Diego, get the fuck out of here before I kill you. Fear enters Diego, knowing how much danger he is currently in. Diego and Cord walk away from the group and enter the facility. While walking, Diego places his hand on Cord's shoulder. 
Don't worry, Cord. We're going to save the world. Lafleur and Wayne start walking in the other direction towards the community. We'll see you guys later on. How long do you think it will take to walk? Took over an hour to get here by cart. Four hours walking, maybe? Lafleur and Wayne start walking, hoping fate will let them make it back to the facility in one piece. Danny, Lillian, Gillian, stay with us. The rest of you please take the cart back with Alex's body. The other community members get inside one of the carts and ride off along the road. After a couple of minutes, they pass Lafleur and Wayne. Lafleur watches them ride past her with hope in her eyes. Back at the camp, Violet walks up to Danny and Lillian. Come on, we'll take you back. Nice hot bath will do you too good. You have hot water? Chapter 12. Confrontation. Lafleur and Wayne walk along the road, trying to get back to the community. Lafleur watches the cart fade off into the distance while retying her hair back into a bun. Wayne stops dead in his tracks and looks at Lafleur, silently judging her. Why didn't you have my back? Lafleur stops walking and turns around to Wayne. What? In the community. When I took the gun, why didn't you have my back? It was a stupid move. Even if we got out alive, then what? We'd find a place and survive. Why don't we do that now? We haven't got a reason to go back. They have a place with food, water, houses. Do you really think we can do anything better? That's why we're going there. It's our best chance to survive. Do you really think they'll accept us? They didn't want us. They were unsure, which means their minds can change. Do you know what? Fuck you. Great. Been waiting for another chance. You have no idea how much I've been replaying it in my head. No, you fucking peek. You want to go off alone. Be my guest. Lafleur starts walking away from Wayne, leaving him there alone. Wayne runs up behind Lafleur and jumps on her back. Ah! What are you doing? I want you to come with me. Just us two. We could spend the rest of our days fucking. Lafleur moves around all over the road trying to get Wayne off her, but he holds on tight, making it look like he's riding a bull. It'll be better if you come willingly, but I'll force you if I have to. Lafleur reaches her hand up behind her head and pulls out her hair stick, letting her light blonde hair flow down. She grips the hair stick and stabs Wayne in the side of the chest. Wayne falls off Lafleur and onto the ground. Ah! Lafleur climbs on top of him, placing her hands on his arms, pinning him to the ground. Where are you going to rape me? It's not rape if you enjoy it. Lafleur forces her hands onto the side of Wayne's head and starts pushing her thumbs into his eyes. Ah! Ah! Lafleur suddenly stops. She looks at what she's doing, and then at her hands. And finally she climbs up off Wayne and spits on him. My eyes! You bitch! Your chest is bleeding out pretty badly. Burn in hell! Lafleur drops her hair stick on the floor and walks away from Wayne, making her way off to get back to the community. As she walks away, she begins to feel free and good about herself. Wayne lies on the floor, unable to see and bleeding out from the chest, unsure of what to do. Chapter 13. Look of the Irish. Back outside the facility, Danny, Lillian, Violet, Liam and Killian are all getting inside the cart, with Killian controlling the horses. Before they depart, Danny looks up to have a look at the facility for the last time. Uh, guys? Everyone looks towards the facility to see a horde of infected running out of the hole caused by the explosion and running straight towards them. Get us out of here, Killian! Killian whips the horses to get them running as the infected chase behind them. We got a problem. The horses didn't get enough rest. They're too tired to go any faster. The infected begin to get closer and closer to the cart, knowing food is within their reach. Okay, we can't outrun them, so what? Fight? Go off road. We can lose them in the trees. Make our way on foot until it's safe. I've got a better idea, but you've got to have faith. You say that about everything. What's your idea? Either of you two know how to ride a horse? No. Me neither. Okay. Lillian and Violet on one horse, Danny and Liam on the other. I cut the ropes, and the horses can run faster without all this weight holding them back. What happens to you? Have faith. Besides, it's the only option we have. He's right. How can you say that, Liam? The only way out of here is by horse, and only four of us can ride them. We both know he's not going to let us die, so it's pointless to argue with him. Liam ends the conversation by jumping onto a horse and turning around ready to catch Danny. Jump, Danny! Danny jumps onto the horse. Violet realises there's no other way than says goodbye to Killian. She unties her ribbon holding her hair together and wraps it around Killian's hand. Good luck, Killian. I'll have faith. Luck of the Irish. 
See you back at the community. Violet jumps off the cart onto the spare horse. Lillian, looking very unsteady, stares at the ground between the moving cart and the horse. What happens if I don't make the horse? Hope you die before the infected get you. Relax, it looks harder than it is. Lillian turns to Killian and looks him straight in the eyes. Thank you. For everything. Saved us twice now. Lillian jumps off the cart and onto Violet's horse, landing just behind her and wrapping her arms around Violet's waist. Have faith! Killian pulls out his knife, cutting the ropes to the horses. Both horses go racing off and the cart grinds to a stop. Killian takes one last look as his friends escape. He turns around, pulling out a second knife, ready to meet the infected. As the first few infected arrive, he starts slashing away. He cuts Brad's throat, sending blood spraying all over his face. Killian splits blood out of his mouth, hoping that it's not enough to turn him. However, blood is still all over his face and in his eyes. Come and get me. 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 Killian's body starts shaking and twisting as the rage virus takes over his body. He violently twists in every direction and starts using his knives to slash out the infected calling towards him. He manages to take out a total of 15 infected, including Brad and Mr. Raven, before he turns. Violet and Liam continue riding the horses as fast as they can towards the community. We should be back in under an hour. We might catch up to the others. It shouldn't take us long without the cart. We can't go back. Why not? The infected are following us. We keep going, not only will we lead them to the community, but the other cart, Lafleur and Wayne, we have to lead them away. That's nonsense. Killian will take care of them. Violet, he's right. I know where we can go. Lillian gives them instructions, and before long they arrive at the car crash from the previous day. They get off the horses for a rest. Lillian walks over to the truck her and Danny were driving. She opens the door and pulls out her book and puts it in the green backpack. Did you bring us here so we could get you a book? It was more of a happy bonus. Is anything special about that book? Nope. She just likes to read. It's called The Beach. Good so far, but I'm not even halfway. Well, at least now you can finish it. So what now? Rest here for a few minutes, then start going towards the community. If the infected follow us out this far, they will keep going in the wrong direction. Does your community have a name? Yeah, it's called Port in the Storm. We figured it was an appropriate name. I heard you on the radio. Yeah, we, we send out messages every now and again to see if anyone's out there. Can we just get back now? I haven't slept in over 28 hours. We can do all this socialising bollocks later. Lillian pulls more backpacks out of the car and throws them towards the others. Here are some supplies we took from the facility, not worth leaving them behind. They all get up onto the horses and ride off towards the community. Chapter 14. A Port in the Storm. Open the gates! A guard on top of a lookout tower calls down to another person by the gate. The wooden gate is drawn open and Liam, Violet, Danny and Lillian ride into the community. Near the gate, Liam spots the other cart that left with them, still containing Alex's body. Well, at least we know they made it back. Somebody's going to have to break the news to Mariana and Charlotte. I'll do it. Need to pick Tommy up anyway. Danny, Lillian, don't worry, we'll hold a funeral for Alex. Thank you. That's very kind. You guys should put some more people on lookout just in case the infected finds us. Don't worry, Danny. We know how to protect this place. Now, you're both new here. Before we show you around, is there anything about you guys that we should know, or anything you guys like or need in particular? As long as I'm not the leader, I'm good. Yeah, actually. I'm a vegan, so I only eat fruit and vegetables. Don't worry about that. We grow a lot of our own food. Liam, Violet, we've got someone at the gate. Says her name is Lafleur. Open up the gate. The gate is pulled open, and Lafleur walks into the community towards the group. I'm going to go have a look around. Danny. Are you going to be alright living with her? As long as she stays out of my way, I won't do anything. Danny walks away just as Lafleur arrives. She walks up to the group with her light blonde hair flowing down to her shoulders. She no longer has her military uniform on, but rather jeans and a jacket, no longer resembling her former self. He'll take some time to come around. I understand. And I am sorry. I had the wrong information. Let's just start anew. I'll try and get Danny to come around. Lafleur? How did you get here so fast? And where's Wayne? 
He attacked me, so I fought back. I injured him, but I stopped before killing him. You probably don't want to hear, but it's the truth. I got lucky and found a car with clothes inside. No longer have a reason to wear the uniform. We'd rather hear the truth than a lie. It's a good look for you. Your hand on suits you. Thank you. Yeah, we were, we were never sure about Wayne. Not the kind of person we wanted around. Happy to have you, though. Your skill set will help this place out hugely. When did you leave Wayne behind? The, uh, the infected tailed us out of the, the facility. We weren't too far off. If they got him, he deserves a lot worse. Anyway, this community is called a port in the storm. That's a clever name. Well, this place and all its people here are the way we're going to save the world. Yeah, that's the cure to all this. No magic bullet, no chosen one. The cure is just everyone helping. If everyone does their bit, we'll be able to save the world. Now let's show you two around. 28 days left. Hi there, thanks for watching. Don't forget to follow us all on Facebook and click subscribe for any new content. This was performed by a group of talented voice actors, including me. If the storage is well enough, a couple of one-shots will be put into production. Uh, but yeah. Thanks for watching. Bye.